Well, God is good, amen? amen? He is good to us. Well, welcome to our combined service this Sunday. We are glad you're here. I have to remind myself that I don't have to pause for live translation. That's what I'm used to doing <laughs> 99% of the time. So if I pause once in a while, I'm waiting for this person to... to uh, to say something, but there, thank you for doing it at the back. Give, give a hand to our translators. Thank you for, for doing that. It's an incredible work. I don't know how the mind could possibly work that way, to be able to hear and translate live. So thank you for doing that. Well, God is good. Amen. He is good to us, and he is moving in our lives. Uh, I want to remind you as well that we're having food after service. Isn't that great? I know you're not all here for the food, right? If, uh, <laughs> but uh, we're going to have some great food afterwards. We have uh, many that are working hard on that even right now. We're going to be sharing a key verse from the book of Jeremiah today. And if you would all stand for a moment, we're going to read from the word of the Lord and then pray over today's message. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31, it says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Let us pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that by the spirit of the living God that you would touch the hearts of your people. Lord, let the faith of your people rests not on the wisdom of man, but on your power. Thank you, Lord, that we do not share in words of human wisdom, but by the power of your Spirit. Let your Holy Spirit be teacher today and lead us into all truth. Transform our lives radically, Lord. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you today about a topic most of you understand. You may not realize you understand it. But it is the topic of authority. Now, most of us hopefully have learned about authority because if you haven't, your resume probably has 17 different jobs on it. Is that fair to say? Because you have not figured out how to submit to authority or you have problems with the government, or you have problems with your taxes, or you have problems with creditors, or you just don't understand authority. But, you know, we are called to be a people that grow in understanding authority. Uh, we, we looked at covenant last week, and wow, how important is covenant to us? How much has God blessed us to be part of the new covenant? This is what Jeremiah was talking about. He was talking about a new covenant that was coming. We don't have to live under the old covenant where they had to sacrifice animals, where their sins were only temporarily covered. But as Pastor Amari touched on, as Milo touched on as well, the sacrifice of Jesus, what Jesus has done for us, has brought us a new covenant. But here's the thing I want you to know today. If you want to understand covenant... If you want to really understand this new covenant that God has given us, that God has given us something brand new, we can only understand it if we understand authority. I think much of, much of life for many people has been, you know, certainly if you look throughout the history of the Bible, it's a story of people rejecting authority, isn't it? Over and over and over again. From Adam and Eve all the way to, through to when Paul addresses the church. It's people rejecting authority. They did it to Moses. Uh, Satan did it to God when he rejected him and was cast out of heaven. It is a key to our Christian walk is understanding authority. Don't you think we should understand it today? If you agree with that, say amen. Well, three of you agree with that. But I'm going to preach anyways. I'm going to keep going. How many of you want to learn about authority today? Amen? Amen. Well, that's half of you, so I'm going to keep going. You know, and when we understand authority, uh, we may not think we understand it, or we, but we live in it constantly. I, 
I thought of this example during the week that uh, with the building that we're in right now, where we're sitting, the chairs you're sitting in, the building we are in, where we operate the preschool and have the church and operate all of our ministries, there's a reason that we can come in here every Sunday and Monday through Friday and Saturdays as well is because we have this. This, my friends, is a contract. This is the contract that says that we, right now, and I can be in this building, that I can have a key for the building, that we can do what we want to in this building within reason, that we can do certain things and we can't do certain things, but that's in the contract, isn't it? And it's this contract that, by the way, took nine months to negotiate. Yes, nine months. I think that's about how long it takes a baby to be born. But, <laughs> but that's how long this contract, 66 pages. Do you see how thick that is? 66 pages. And that's pretty small writing, by the way. I'm going to have Amari cover the left eye and read to me line one and cover the right eye. And is that clearer or better or worse? Okay, you can't, he can't read it. That's pretty small writing for 66 pages of a contract, but it's this contract that determines when we can use the facility, which is 24 seven, we have access to this facility. It, part of the contract was for when we use the upstairs of the building as well. And we have to understand the contract because this allows us to know our, what we have or what we don't have. Now, for example, if someone that I did not know, if right now they walked in through that door and they said, what are you guys doing in here? They said, I don't know if I like this preaching or not. Now, I know none of you are thinking that, but if that person walked in and they said that right now and they said, well, why do you have the, the, I don't like this color of the carpet. You need to change this. What's with those chairs? You're doing lunch afterwards? I don't want you to do lunch afterwards. What would we do with that person? Well, first of all, half of you would be on the phone with 911, right? You'd be saying, what is this person doing here? Because they're not allowed in here. And why is that? Because with a contract, we have what? Authority. We have authority in this place. I would have the authority that if someone is in here that we do not want to be in here, I could say that person would have to leave. And I would have the ability to contact authorities or go to the legal system and say, this is the contract that we have, and this is, this is the one that has authority in this place at this given time. I hate to say it, but there was even a time I had to tell someone they could not be in this building anymore. Well, that's not very nice, Pastor, is it? <laughs> but I had to do it. But why could I do that? Because I had the authority in this place. Remember what God said in Genesis chapter 1. Because now I'm talking about you and me. I think everybody can understand, oh, pastor, well, I understand that you have authority. Because you have the contract. And, well, you're a pastor. And, you know, you've worked in the, you've been in the work world. You understand authority. But uh, are you really talking to me? And it says in Genesis chapter 1. Something about you, something about you individually, and this is critically important for us. In verse 26, the first part of verse 26, Genesis chapter 1, it says, Let us make men in our image after our likeness. This is God talking. And let them have dominion. Do you hear that today? Just meditate on that for a moment. That you... And if you're sitting there yourself, you can say, me, I am created in God's image, and I have been given authority. Not just everybody else, not just the people around me, not just my boss, not just the pastor, but I have been given authority by God. That's something we need to think about, isn't it? You know, what about you? That... When things start to happen in your life, when someone intrudes in your life and starts telling you what to do about the color of the carpet or about the chairs or about the thing you're doing in your life, and you have to, a determination to make at that point in time, don't you? You said, does this voice in my life that is speaking into my life, does this voice have 
authority? Or am I going to give them authority in my life? And what about the authority I've been given in my life? What about that I've been created in the image of God? And what about the contract that I have and the covenant that I have with God? Who's coming into your building and telling you what to do? That's the question today, isn't it? Because the enemy we know comes to steal and kill and destroy, doesn't he? But Jesus has given, come to give us life. Sometimes the enemy comes into our life, and how do we handle this? How do we handle the situation? What is our reaction to that? You know, when we were uh, finishing building the, uh, this facility, as most of you know, it was dirt when we came in. It was dirt outside, dirt inside, and we were here early on. And when I was, during those nine months, only by God's wisdom, I can tell you this, that I was able to have something in my mind. I don't know how it came to me, and I don't know why it came to me, but I had put something into the contract that said the maximum cost we would have if the city starts to tell us things aren't right or they need us to change things, that the maximum cost we would have is $3,000. Well, nine months goes by, and then they're building the facility. We're waiting to get access to the facility, and we suddenly find out that the city says we have to do a sound study. Now, what does that mean, a sound study? Like, is that like for sound technicians, like people running? The, what is that? But we actually had to do a study because we had the preschool to have someone come out and see how loud it is outside there because of the freeway. Like, literally. Now, if you had to guess for a moment, to have someone come out with a thing that measures decibel levels, and then they write a report, how much do you think that would cost? Just any, just think of a, think of a number in your head, and you'll win a prize if you get it right. Well, no, you won't. But, but just imagine for a moment, you know, how much it would cost. Now, I would think, see, this is just me. I would go to Radio Shack. Is there a Radio Shack anymore? I would go to a Best Buy, and I would buy something, and it would measure the decibel levels, or I would use the one we have at the back with the sound people. I would grab that, I would walk outside, and I would hold it up, and I would look at it, and I would go, oh, it's too loud. We need a wall. We need a wall over there to block the sound. And then I would charge, I don't know, 20 bucks to do that, right? But no, it was $10,000 to do that. $10,000 to pay someone to say that it's loud. <laughs> Can I pay you $20 to go out there and say it's loud? We would have saved $99,980. So when that happened, they, uh, when we're going through the contract and through the building, they say, well, you're going to have to pay $10,000 to pay this person to do this sound study for you. And I thought, well, I remembered something. I, what? There was a time, I think, let me look through it. Maybe it's on page 27 of subsection D, paragraph 4, number 3. Yeah, there it is, right there, where, where it says the maximum cost we have is $3,000. <laughs> And we didn't have to pay for it. And then they had to build a wall that they didn't expect to build, and that cost another $10,000. And guess how much of that we paid? We paid zero of that. But only because I knew the contract, hello? I mean, they would have let me pay it, by the way. <laughs> right? Wouldn't they have let me pay it? You can, you can keep those just for a second. Wouldn't, that's your part of the con. No, those are just the... <laughs> Those are, that's, that's the worship contract with you. So those are the words they're going to sing for you. No, no extra charge for that. Now, they would have let me pay that money, wouldn't they? But, uh, seriously, let's be serious now. Let's not be religious or, or spiritual here. Let's pretend we're real people. And if I gave them a real check, they would have accepted that check, deposited it, and spent all the money. Amen? But you would say, well, yeah, but... That's not in the contract. They're not supposed to. Yeah, but I let them have it. I'm the one that had the authority. I didn't know what was in the contract. I paid them the money, and they could care less. Doesn't this tell us something about our spiritual walk? 
Doesn't this tell us something about who walks into your building, into our building, the building of our life, and starts to order us around and starts to tell us, you need to pay this, you need to pay this price for that, you need to do this or, th or that, whatever it would be, and then we don't know what God has said about us. You see, if we don't know that we're created in God's image and that we've been given dominion, yes, you individually, each of you, not just me, but you as well, that God has made a contract or a covenant with you. You see, if we understand authority, do you know today that we can understand faith? How many of you know that faith is pretty important in, in the spiritual walk? Have you picked that up yet? I, mean, I hope you have. Faith is of highest importance. It is faith is, faith is the beginning of even our belief and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We, walk by, we don't walk by sight, do we? We walk by what? By faith. And so faith is of critical importance, and we sing about it, we think about it, we pray about it, we read about it, but how do we live faith? How do we live faith on a day-to-day -day basis when we're confronted with challenges? To understand, if you understand authority, you can then begin to have faith. I want you to hear a story today about a Roman centurion. It's in Matthew chapter 8. If you'd like to look at it, it's in Matthew chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. If you have your Bibles, you can look at this. You can read through the whole story later because it's a pretty detailed story. I'm just going to focus in on two verses, but... Imagine this for a moment, that you have a Roman centurion, so this is not a Jewish person, this is not an Israelite, this is not part of the tribe of Israel, this is not one that Jesus even initially came for when he came for the Jewish people, but yet you have this Roman soldier who, by the way, the Roman soldiers weren't viewed very positively by the Jewish people, hello? I mean, they were under their rule. They, they were under their rule for for even hundreds of years, and we come to this story where a Roman centurion comes to Jesus because that Roman centurion has a servant that is sick. This Roman centurion has heard enough about Jesus that he says, I need to go to Jesus because I have a servant that is ill, and I need to go to him to ask for healing, because I've heard the stories, probably his buddies at work, right? His other Roman centurion buddies, like they were the police force of the time, the military of the time, that they were talking amongst each other, and they're like, man, this guy's doing some crazy stuff. I mean, there are, there are people being healed, running around, I mean, people I couldn't see before, the people that used to give us trouble, all those demonic spirits, all those people. Man, we had so many 911 calls for that demonic spirit guy. Did they have 911 back then? Maybe not. But the demonic spirits, people were cast, the, the demons were cast out. People were healed. They were made whole. And the Roman centurion hears about all this going on. And he comes to Jesus to ask for his servant to be healed. But I want to key in on two particular verses about what the centurion said to Jesus. Listen to verse 8. The centurion says to Jesus, For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Listen to the reaction of Jesus, because I, you need to have this reaction from Jesus when you come in faith to him. This is the reaction in verse 10. It says, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such great faith. Amazing. Isn't that amazing? Listen to what Jesus said to the centurion, to the centurion, by the way, who is not Jewish, who is not Israelite. Did I mention that? Did I mention that he was not part of the nation? Did I mention that he was part of the people that were oppressing the Jewish people? That he was part of the military that was overseeing them? 
And Jesus said, Jesus was astounded. It said he marveled at his faith and and he looked at him and said, I have never seen such great faith in the entire nation of Israel. And by the way, Jesus has been around uh, even before he was born, amen? <laughs> he was before the beginning. He knew Israel when it was like Moses Israel and we're all Abraham Israel, all the way back, right? He said he never seen such great faith in Israel. And what is the distinguishing factor that he had that Jesus said, this man has great faith. How many of you want to have great faith? Amen? I'll tell you, if you have great faith, you will see great things in your life. There's no doubt about that. Because it is God who is the one who acts on your faith, isn't he? He's excited about your faith. Who wouldn't be excited about faith? I mean, all all of us, if you aren't a parent now, you had a parent, right? You were a child at one time. How much do the parents get excited when they actually believe something you say? Wow, you really trust me on that, huh? That's, that's pretty exciting that you think I can do that. Well, how much, how much is God excited? Our Heavenly Father, he's pretty excited when we come to him in faith because we're trusting him. We're not walking by everything we see and all the pain we see around us and the poverty we live in and the pain we, pains we've experienced or the healing we need. We're not focused on that, but we're focused in faith. And what did this Roman centurion do is he understood authority. That was the main difference, wasn't it? He even said to Jesus, it's amazing, read through the whole story, but it's amazing what he says to Jesus because He says to Jesus, you don't even need to come to my house. Now, look, if you had the choice and you knew some faith healer, I guarantee you, you're going to say, come to my house, right? Like, I'm paying for the full package. If my kid is sick or my, you know, someone I know is sick, I want you, faith healer person, I want you personally to come to my house to walk into the door. I want you to lay hands on them, and I want you to touch them. I want you to get the oil. I want you to get a whole bucket of oil. I want you to do a whole thing, right? And you are going to do that for me because that's what I have faith in. But the centurion, he turns down Jesus coming to his house. He says, all you have to do is what? Say the word why because he understood authority look do you think every time that i walk up to this building i think to myself oh can i come in i mean what's mentally wrong with me don't answer that question (laughs) if if i think that every day i wonder if i can come in today i wonder if my key will work I wonder if someone will make me leave. What what is wrong with me if I think that? But you see, we understand that Jesus just needs to speak the word, and it is finished. Amen? Amen. You see, we we struggle so often, but many times our prayers, and hear me today, many times our prayers are due to a lack of faith. Okay, now, hear me out, because... We need to understand that just like the centurion did is I don't have to beg, borrow, and plead to walk into this building every day. Do you understand what I'm saying today? I don't have to get on my knees and say, God, please let me into this building today. Give me the favor to... What's wrong with me if I do that? Again, don't answer the question. That's rhetorical. That... We need to understand today that if Jesus has said the word, that it's finished. If Jesus can speak to us and say, I give you healing, then it is finished. But see, if we understand authority, we understand that he has been given all authority. You know, there's an incredible man that if you you look this up, you can Google his name, but his name is George Muller. M-U-L-L-E-R. I think we have a picture of him. But he lived in the 1800s. He looked like he lived in the 1800s. Why do you look like you live in the 1800s, right? But he looked like he lived in the 1800s, or he should be on some kind of a cereal box or oatmeal box or something. But he lived for 93 years, and he lived in the 1800s. And you can Google his name, George Muller, 
he'll come up. But when he lived in the 1800s, he had an encounter with God about prayer. And so he was committed, a truly committed man of prayer, and he would document all of his prayers. He would write them down, and he would track them. And over his lifetime, he had over 50,000 50, documented answers to prayer. He was a man who understood faith, and he understood authority. 50,000, I mean, we don't live 50,000 days. Hello, if you do the math. Okay, so... 50,000 answers to prayer documented. He lived to 93 years old. In the 1800s, he helped to distribute over 30 million religious booklets, including Bibles. 30 million? I don't think we had 30 million people living in the United States at that point in time. I'm pretty sure it was less than that. I should probably have looked that up. But 30 million, he supported 150 missionaries, and he started five orphanages. One person did this because he understood faith, and he understood authority. But the Bible, when I look at the Bible, it didn't say in Genesis chapter 1, let's look at it again, right? Genesis chapter 1, it said, then, I'll give you a paraphrase, okay? Stay with me. Then God said, let us make George Muller in our image. No, wait, I'm sorry. It's you. It's man. He's just one person who applied that faith. And by the way, just as a side note, that of those 50,000 answered prayers, 5,000 of them were answered within about the first week or so. Like immediately, those prayers were answered. But guess what? That means the other 45,000 didn't <laughs> happen right away. There was even one man that he prayed for for 60 years before he came to faith in Jesus Christ. So this isn't authority. You're misunderstanding authority if you think that authority means I say something and it's done, okay? You're, what, you're thinking of the movie Aladdin if you're thinking that, okay? You're, you're wrong movie, okay? This is, this is the story of the Bible, okay? Not the story of Robin Williams doing Aladdin. It's not, it's not like that. It's not a gr grant you three wishes. It's that we understand authority and we trust in God. You know, we today we have a personal contract with God. Do you understand that today? A personal contract with God. Thank God we didn't have to work 9 months on it. Thank God that by the time we were born it was already completed. The new covenant had already been written, it had already been established. But I want to challenge you today, each and every one of you, because each and every one of you have been created in the image of God. Each and every one of you are a child of God. If you've committed your life to the Lord and by faith have asked him into your heart, you are a child of God, and you have been given dominion. You have been given authority in your life. But I want to challenge each of you personally today that I wonder, in our lives, do we have any no trespassing signs. That's my question for you. In our life, our personal life, not talking about me, not talking about your neighbor, you, the one sitting in your chair, that's you, that do you have any no trespassing signs in your life? You know, actually, oh man, this would have been a great illustration if I just had a no trespassing sign that I did not think to get one. Does anybody have a no trespassing sign with them? that I could borrow. Did anyone bring one in? Did anyone? Oh, you brought, Sean, you brought one in. Thank you. Oh my God. Look at that. That's a great note. Now see, some people are thinking ahead at this service to bring in a no trust. It's Sean's like, what, what might Pastor Mike need today? I just wonder. And I got, it was a no trust. I would have just expected a small no trespassing sign. How many of you have no trespassing signs in your life. Because I'll tell you this, if you don't have any in your life, then you're in for a long, long life, my friends. Look, don't we all understand this at some level? That if a random person, when you go home today, if a random person is at your house sleeping on your couch, what are you going to do? 
Now, if you tell me you're going to cook them a meal and make them an extra bed, then you have something wrong with you. Okay? You might need help or you might need medication, but that has side effects. Please just call for help. Call the police. Tell them to leave. But seriously, though, do we have no trespassing signs in our life? Or do we just let everything happen because that's just me? That's how I view myself. I, I can let anything happen in my life. You personally have to consider this today. You have been given dominion, which means you have authority over a certain area in your life. But you need to understand what that area is, don't you? You need to understand what that area is. And you tell me this, how in the world could I function here if I didn't know something about what this said? They could start charging me any amount of money. They could tell me I can do, can do or cannot do certain things. But if I don't know what this says, I'm in trouble. Well, let me tell you this, my friends. If you don't know what God's contract with you says, you are going to be in serious trouble because you're going to get a bill in the mail and you will just pay it. And you'll say, but, but I didn't have to pay it. Well, you did. It doesn't matter if you had to or not. If you choose to pay the bill, they're not going to send the money back. Hello. That's not any business I know of. But you see, if we understand God's word, if we understand the covenant that we have, the trust that we can have in him today, my friends, God is going to do an amazing work in your life because you're taking dominion. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, and this is the reaction that we have. If we understand our contract with God, what does it say in Hebrews chapter 4? This is verse 16. It says, let us therefore come boldly. Did you hear that word? Yes. Boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, this is a reaction of someone who understands authority. That you say that I am a child of God, that I have access to all the promises of God, and I act like it. I don't act like someone who's being kicked around all the time and someone who can tell, have anybody tell you what to do and you just do it. But you say, no, I understand my authority in Christ and I understand my spiritual authority. So when things come into your house, such as sickness, such as poverty, such as death, that you say that I am a child of God and I need my no trespassing sign. And I need to, but you, guess what? Guess what? Who enforces the no trespassing sign? I mean, do you need God to dial 911 for you all the time? Can't you do that? Can't you enforce, hasn't God given you dominion? Hasn't he delegated that to you? To say, this does not belong in my house. You would kick out the guy on your couch. But what about when things come against your family? What about spiritual things? What about spiritual attacks that come against you? What kind of no trespassing signs do you put up to say, I will not allow this in my family, that I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe and I'm going to trust God and I'm going to say, God, you have given me authority over this household that I'm in. I'm talking about you today, each of you individually. What about in your life? Look, you know when something's coming into your life that shouldn't be there, don't you? Hello? You know the guy on the couch, but what about the things coming into your house? What about the things coming into your heart? And you, because you have that authority, understand, even the Roman soldier understood this, that he understood authority, and you need to understand today that God has delegated authority to you, that in the name of Jesus, you have access to the promises of God. The Bible says in Mark 11 that we can say to a mountain, be thou moved and cast into the sea, and it will be done. Doesn't it say that, I believe, right? And so if it says that, then God's delegated authority back to you, and our contract is his word. You should know what's in this word, my friends, because things will be taken from you that you don't even know were taken, won't you, until you read about it. 
I can remember for, for Karen and I when things have been stolen out of our life that, you know, I remember reading in the book of Proverbs and other places in the Old Testament that if a thief is found out, that he must repay sevenfold what's been taken. So guess what? When things are stolen from us, I don't go, woe is me. I say, you know what, God? This thing that's been stolen, that in the spiritual realm, that I believe that you will give me back seven times what's been taken from us. You know what that is? That's enforcing your contract. That's not begging, borrowing, and pleading. That's not sitting in front of that door and saying, why can't, can I come into the building today? Hello. You understand that you have a contract with God that's not been negotiated nine months, but it's been negotiated from the very foundation of the earth and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not paid for by ink on a piece of paper and printed on a stupid printer. Hello. This is something that will diminish after time. This is something that will be gone and worthless over time. This is a contract that's only good for up to 20 years, but hello, this is an eternal contract, my friends. And you need to understand this contract better than you understand the lease from your house. Hello? Look, if you understand the lease from your house better than you understand this word, you are going to be in trouble during this lifetime, my friends. You, because things will be stolen from you and you won't even know they were taken from you. That you won't even, you didn't even know they were yours. Hello? If you don't know something's yours, tell me how you know it'll be stolen. Can you think about that for a second? If you don't know something's yours, explain to me how you will know it's been stolen. This is how you know what's yours. And then you'll know it's been stolen, and then you call the enemy out on it. And you say, what's been stolen from me is going to be returned. My children that have been stolen from me are going to be returned. Hello? Authority. You've been given authority over your household, over your, you have dominion over your household. If your child has been stolen from you, you need to demand that child back from the enemy that's stolen it from you. God didn't steal it from you. The enemy steals, kills, and destroys. If you don't understand the contract, you may think it was God that stole it from you. How sad would that be? Well, if you think God stole it from you, who are you going to call on? Hello? Why would you come boldly before the throne of grace if you think God stole something from you? That's just ridiculous. It's the enemy that is stolen from you. Understand authority today. If you can understand authority, Jesus will see that faith and God will move in your lives. I want, I want to challenge you today. What is that no trespassing sign in your life that you say the enemy has come into my life and you know what? I think I let him in. And I think I didn't realize he was here. And I think I forgot I could tell him he had to leave. Hello? There's some things in your household that you need to tell to leave. And I'm talking about spiritual things today. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying go home and tell your grandmother she has to move out. Okay? I'm not saying that. Okay? This is spiritual, my friends. Okay? I'm talking about spiritual things that you must have this no trespassing sign because why? I have dominion in my life because it's been delegated to me by Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus. But you, my friends, are the ones that need to enforce it. So I challenge you today. What is it in your life that is a stronghold, as the song says? What's a stronghold in your life, something that's been holding you back, imprisoning you, keeping you in slavery? What is it? Well, many times we say, God, remove this from me. Take this away from me. Take this sin away from me. And God's waiting on you to say, why don't you tell it to leave? How about that? Amen? How about you tell it to leave? How about you say, in the name of Jesus, I claim authority over this place by the authority delegated to me, not by the state of California, hello, 
but by God himself, that he said he's given you dominion, which means you have authority to say who's trespassing in your land. Amen? And so as you pray today, <clears throat> let there be something that you say needs to be changed in your life. It could be something that relates to a relationship. It could be something that relates to healing and health or prosperity or poverty that's taken place in your home. And you say, you know what? I'm reminded now, I have the keys to this house, hello. And I have authority in this place. And I challenge you today to say, what is the prayer you need to pray? And you need to pray, and you need to pray. Not me, you, you for your house. God didn't give me authority over your house. He gave you authority over your house. And so I'm teaching you and challenging you to take the authority and go to your house, even this day, even this day, to go to your physical house. And you say, in the name of Jesus, this place is your home, Lord. And nothing that is of the enemy is allowed in this place. That's calling 911, isn't it? But it's calling, coming boldly before the throne of grace, 911. Amen. Trust the Lord today, but I challenge you and I implore you to take your authority back in the name of Jesus and not allow things in your life because maybe you didn't know the contract. Maybe you paid the price for something you weren't supposed to pay for. Well, I'm sorry, that money's already gone, but guess what? No more, amen? No more because I will know the contract and I will enforce the contract and I will be like the Roman centurion and say, God, you have all authority and you've given me dominion over my household. When we pray today, I ask the Holy Spirit to put something in your heart but I ask you to go home and enforce it today. When you walk through your threshold of your door, say, in the name of Jesus, you have given me this household. You have given me these children or this family. And by the power in the name of Jesus, that this is your house, Lord, that you have given me a new covenant sealed in your blood and set for eternity that is more important than the contract for the apartment you live in, hello? So let's pray this morning, and I ask that God would touch your hearts in a powerful way. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, come and do what you do, Lord God. The song says, mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loosed by the power of your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that your people, by the Holy Spirit, would perceive something in their hearts right this moment about something that's been allowed in their lives or in their hearts or in their homes or in their finances or in their bodies that is not of you, Lord. I pray by the Holy Spirit you would reveal that to them right now and they would react with great boldness to come before your throne in their time of need and say, in the name of Jesus, I need your help, Lord God, and I know that you will help. I know that you will move on my behalf. Even when I don't see it, Lord, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, I know you're working, Lord. So, Lord, let that mountain be moved. Jesus said to you, not to, not generically to everyone, but he said to you specifically, he said, you speak to that mountain and say, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it shall be done for them. So I accept the authority you've been delegated to me, Lord, to have these mountains move out of my life, to have these strongholds broken in my life. Touch your people today and refresh them, Lord. If you've never committed your life to Jesus, I encourage you to do it today in this moment in time. To enter into that covenant with God, but it's by your choice and by your free will. Just to pray, dear Lord Jesus, I ask you into my heart today. I thank you for the sacrifice you made on Calvary. I thank you that, Lord, you lived a sinless life, that you died. 
and you rose again from the dead. And I thank you, Lord, by your life that I might have life, that through your resurrection, I might have resurrection. By faith today, I ask you into my heart. And I thank you that your word says that all that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Commit your life to him today. Lord, I pray a blessing over your people. I pray that you move in their lives in a great and powerful way. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. We'll give the Lord a hand clap today.